Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder when I head out from the library and deliver an episode to you while I walk home. I'm Brendan Riley. Well, good afternoon, listeners. It's part two of my walk here on March uh, 5th, and I'm pleased to be talking with you. I'm on way home with a couple of movies from the library. I've got uh, Interstellar, the Christopher Nolan uh, pretentious extra long sci fi film, which I've always meant to watch and never got around to. And I have Life, which is, I don't know about, it's like a, you know, we should be afraid of Martian bugs kind of movie. Ah, it looks fun. I'll give it a try, I thought. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I'm carrying home from the library. As we walk, I thought I would talk with you a little bit about art. So I have mentioned a few times that my design partner and I are shifting into publication mode again for the first time since, oh boy, 2000, uh, 2015. That seems like a long time ago. Uh, so Rattlebox Games is a design collective where we also have done some publishing. Um, we published a game called Cromlech a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and We did a Kickstarter, and we delivered it, and we have, mm, I don't know, 75 copies kicking around somewhere. We didn't make any money on it, but we didn't lose any money either. I guess if we sell those copies, we would make some money. And we have, as uh, part of our our current plan, uh, we have the another game finally coming to market. You know, since then, we've designed uh, a couple dozen games and shopped some of them around and shelved some of them and... You move them in various ways. And many of you have been listening uh, as I've gone through those travails. But the current game that we are working on bringing to market, and we've actively placed placed a stake in doing so, is a, is a co-op flip and write game called Titania Ascending. It was originally called Gameshire, and I've talked about that before. But now uh, it is uh, moving forward with the, with the title Titania Ascending. So we are currently in the steps of developing art. We had some talk with uh, our par- publishing partners about what what the art would be like and what it was for and how it would work. Because while I'm someone who certainly enjoys board game art, I b- would by no means consider myself somebody with a uh, significant guiding taste. If that could be, if that could be stated, like I, like I can respond to art, but I certainly don't know what to say about it, nor how to direct somebody. So a big part of what what I'm learning in this step of the process is talking with people who do think a lot about how art shapes the board game experience and uh, trying to understand that. So I thought today I would take some of the lessons that have come out of that conversation about Titania Ascending. By the way, keep an eye out for that as a Kickstarter event in mid, mid, the mid-summer, probably mid-July is what we're looking at right now. And thinking about how the art process that we're talking about um, how that appears in other games. So sort of as we're talking about how art should work in games and how it does work in games, I'm reflecting on my experience of seeing art in other games and sort of talking about, well, okay, that seems to work. So I made a list of six games that I thought the art played a significant role in the experience of, in my experience of the game. A lot of these are games where I think the art is really incredible, but more importantly, what I'm looking for here is games, uh, games where the art does important labor in terms of world building, in terms of shaping the experience of the game, and so on. Now, I'm afraid this list is a little trite. I bet one, two, three, four of the games, four of the six games that I've listed here, you off the top of your head are going like, oh yeah, I bet he's going to talk about this and that and that. that." So, apologies if this seems obvious, but I did kind of make this list on the spur of the moment, and I think there's a reason people talk about these games in the context of art. I'm also limited, of course, by the games I've played. So there it is. So the the first game I want to talk about in terms of art and world building is a perennial subject on this on this show, and that is Everdell. So Everdell, if you haven't played it, is an anthropomorph is a, a world of these uh, anthropomorphic animals living in the forest under a big tree, building little towns. And you play the builder of one town. Your opponents each play builders of other towns, and the person who gets the most points wins. And the points are, I don't know, prestige something. There are some shared common goals. 
there are some individual goals. There are some, uh, you're only allowed to build 15 cards into your game, into your, into your tableau, which is the, a big part of the, big part of how the game works. And, uh, you are competing with the others on a shared marketplace for the, uh, characters that you play onto your tableau. Those are the kind of the main things going on. The way that the art in Everdell functions, there are three sort of notable things about it. First, it's just gorgeous. It is beautifully drawn. The artist, the main artist is Andrew Bosley, and he does fantastic work on dozens of pictures of different little critters, and the um, it pays off. You know, this is a game that looks beautiful. On the, the cover is beautiful. As soon as the game's put out, you want to see it, and all of these little animals give a very clear vibe of this kind of medieval town with populated by these different animals. Uh, they do a really good job tying together gameplay function with the name of the creatures. So like, you know, there's a, a ranger and the ranger is able to uh, bring more creatures into your town. There's a undertaker and the undertaker is able to bring more creatures into your cemetery. You know, there's a mayor and the mayor does something else. And like each of the different figures that you could add to your town adds to it in a way that mechanically makes sense based on the, the profession that that character has. The second thing about the art that really works really well in Everdell is that they have pushed the art beyond just the printed matter and into the other components as well. When you go to play Everdell, not only do you, do you find yourself playing with beautiful cards, but you also have these little wooden logs and these little squishy berries and little gold coins. Now I have the deluxe or the collector's edition of Everdell, so I don't know which parts of that make it into the base game. I think the coins are not actually metal in the base game, but I think that the logs and the squishy berries are part of the game there. And then they have this big tree where you keep some things, and that tree is just bling. It doesn't do anything, but it does set the game up nicely to be enjoyed as an art object. Uh, the third thing is the board itself uh, is developed both really nice in a really nice graphical way. It's easy to understand how the board works, but it also develops this idea of a forest and trees and etc. etc. So that's Everdell and how the art works in Everdell. The second game that I bet you could see coming is, is Root. Now Root I would offer as a really interesting counter example. I think Root, I don't, I don't know what to say about Root because Root definitely draws in a lot of people because of its art. A lot of people really like the sort of juvenile style of Kyle Farron. I wouldn't say actually juvenile though. Juvenile style has a look of sort of children's iconography. But I think that there is some percentage of people who are misled by, about what Root is by its art. There's a mismatch there, which interestingly I think still helped the game. Like I think the game sells more because I suspect there are some people who are willing to play Root and try it because of the art. Even though the gameplay, if you told them this is a war game where each army fights a little different way, they're gonna be like, no, I don't want to play a war game. But you know, you get to be the Marquis de Cat. Oh, okay. I want to, I want to be a cat. Uh, it draws you in with that sort of art style into what is a pretty deep war game. Uh, and again, that, that art style carries through through all of the components and I think really, really works well. So Root is another example of a game that, that fits its art style very well. Uh, the third example I will offer is Scythe. Scythe, of course, famously is a world built around paintings that uh, there is a well-documented story about how Jamie Stegmaier really liked Jacob Krasinski's art. I don't think that's his last name. Krasowski, how, she, how that art was really something that Jamie Stegmaier admired. And so he commissioned more of it and built the world sort of around this idea of the steampunk 1920s aesthetic, diesel punk as they call it. And, you know, the, the board itself, I actually find kind of off-putting inside. I don't, I don't like the board, but the place where the game really shines is uh, in the adventure cards or whatever they're called, the exploration cards. There's these cards that you get that kind of have events. And when you play them, They'll have a name and they'll describe what's happening, but often the content of that event comes through on these cards and it really creates a world that's built around this art. So you see this art, you hear the name of the event, and that gives you a sense of what's happening and you get to make a decision that's based not only on 
gameplay tactics, but also on narrative a little bit. And then the game itself has mechanisms that reward ideas about narrative. So for instance, one of the main important resources that you're marshalling during the game is popularity. Sort of like how much do the people like or resent you based on the way that you have handled your country. This is really an important name because it really shapes how you see what's going on on the board. And when the cards then reinforce the decisions connected to that narrative, it really makes the game come alive and move past its abstract nature into being a story. That's Scythe from Stonemaier Games. Uh, the next example that I want to mention, and the, the last of, I think, the really positive examples, I have two sort of counter, counter ones here, is Dungeon Pets. And also to a degree Dungeon Lords, but I think Dungeon Pets more so. Uh, in Dungeon Pets, you play imps who are raising monsters to sell to Dungeon Lords. A Dungeon Lord, of course, is a large monster that owns a dungeon and wants to keep uh, greedy, tre- greedy treasure hunters out so they fill their dungeon with traps and um, with monsters. So you, as imps, are looking to raise the monsters to sell to those dungeon lords. The, the game works really well, and again, if you sort of look at the three-part use of art as designated in, uh, as I talked about with regard to Everdell, you, know, you see very similar emerging ideas there. On the one hand, you have the creatures themselves, the drawings of the monsters, which are all done in this sort of cutesy style, somewhere between Saturday morning cartoons and chibis. Like, these creatures are drawn very adorable, with big eyes and rounded shapes that make them look just lovely, even though they are monsters, right? So that's part of the humor. And you also have these sort of bumbling imps, if you think about it, they're kind of like Um, gnome or uh, goblin versions of like minions, right? They're kind of running all over, doing all sorts of stuff, trying to raise these creatures. So the game fosters this humorous feeling that belies the idea that you're raising these creatures that will eat adventurers. You know, there's a sort of darkness to it, but it's hidden behind the cutesy nature. Um, It, this game probably does hide a little too effectively its difficulty. Like this is a complicated game with a lot going on and a lot of moving pieces that, that it doesn't feel elegant. It is almost creaky under the weight of all the things that happen. I really like it, but uh, it, does, it does suffer a little bit for that. And I think the art doesn't necessarily help with that. That said, the art on the board, the art on the cards, well, not the cards so much, but the art on the, the main board, the art on the player board, it's chock full of little details that really help sell the idea that you are creating a space where you can keep and raise these pets and all of the things that you buy go with them. So like when you buy a, um, when you buy a pen for your creature that automatically resolves each round one of their entertainment needs, the drawing of the pen includes like a jungle gym. Or uh, when you buy an add-on that feeds the meat, in the actual depiction you see this like s- slimy um, writhing pool of grubs for example. So the game does a really nice job of kind of promoting the theme through the artwork on the board, as well as the artwork on the pieces. That's Dungeon Pets. Right, the two games that I would offer that I think the art is really interesting, but I'm not sure how successful it is. Actually, that's not true. All right, the fifth example I have of art that I think really works well is Bunny Kingdom. Now, Bunny Kingdom is a beautiful game uh, by, by Richard Garfield. I, I regret that I did not look up the name of the artist but uh, published by Yellow, and all of the art in the game, again, anthropomorphic creatures, all of the art in the game involves these cute little bunnies doing various things. And the game itself is very mathematical, right? You are drawing these cards, you are drafting these cards and placing your little bunnies on the board to claim regions. And the goal is to claim these interconnected regions and get points by having a variety of different resources available in those regions. So the way that the way the game works is you score each region you get, you score based on how many different resources that region has and how many different towers, which are sort of the cities. Small cities have one tower, medium cities have two, big cities have three. So what you want is a region with as many different resources as you can and a whole bunch of cities, right? So there's this like multiplier going on there. 
while the game is very mathematical, the theme comes through really strongly, again, through this three-part thing. First you have the components themselves. Each player gets this giant herd of tiny little plastic bunnies, which works really well. Uh, it, it makes the board very cute, they're fun to play with. And then the cities can hold the bunnies, like you can put the bunny inside the city. Uh, it works really well and promotes the theme very well. That said, the theme is kind of nonsense and in some ways counterintuitive because having a very large region but only having one or two resources or one or two towns in that region means that you won't score hardly anything for that region, uh, which can be very frustrating because the game feels like it's about area and it's really not so much about area as it is about resources. Now the, um, the cards themselves are all beautiful. They have these elaborate bunny drawings on them that work really well. I would say unlike Scythe or even Everdell, the most of the cards don't really correspond to anything in particular. You know, a lot of the cards are just basically about which region you're going to claim and that what's on the card doesn't really matter there. I would say the biggest place where, there, where it does matter is uh, when you're claiming the scoring cards, a lot of those, the picture does help convey what you would get out of the scoring. Um, but, you know, the game is sort of runs all the way through with the art working really well. Now, whether the art actually conveys the idea of what you're doing in the game, that is, I'm not sure. But uh, it's interesting to think about the game captures, captures you visually with this beautiful art of these bunnies. And the, frankly, the fun name. It's called Bunny Kingdom. It stands out. I like it. All right, so the last game I wanted to mention is uh, a miss for me, was a miss for me, and this is Sentient. Now, Sentient suffered from two things. This is a renegade game. Uh, it's J. Alex Kevern is the designer, and I really liked the gameplay of it, although it was incredibly mathematical and then it involved these sort of low-scale auctions, which were not well-received by my regular gameplay friends, so it did not get played much. Um, the box for this game was incredible. Like the box cover in Sentient is one of my favorite box covers ever. It just looked really cool. And with the promise of a name like Sentient, and the, you know, there's a suggestion that this game has a really deep and interesting story. <laughs> Unfortunately, the game itself is just, it's just sort of uh, auctioning for control of numbers. It really doesn't connect to these, uh, it doesn't connect to the story kind of being implied by the cover. Uh, and frankly, the art inside was not nearly as good as the art outside. So there's a really uh, disappointing shift in the nature of the art, and frankly, the relationship of the art to the story as you go into the game. And I think it put a lot of people off. Now, the dice in the game were beautiful. Again, lovely components, but needed better world building if it was going to work um, as, a, as a game idea. So these are the kinds of things I'm thinking about and the kinds of games I'm pondering as we're considering how to best translate our game idea into a world building experience that people can get behind as they go to play our cooperative flip and write Titania Ascending. So hopefully you found that interesting, an interesting meditation on art in games. I know I've talked about this subject before, but it's been a while, I think, and hopefully I brought something new to the table with this conversation. Uh, if you think so, or even if you don't think so, come by Board Game Geek Guild 3269 and let me know, and uh, we can talk about it. Uh, otherwise, you can reach out to me. Wombat929 is my username on Board Game Geek and Board Game Arena and Boataju and Yukata.de. Uh, or you can email me, Brendan, at Rattlebox Games. Thanks for joining me today on my walk, and I hope your next walk is as pleasant as mine was. Bye bye. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah.